Introducing YouTube memberships, a fun way to support the channel while getting some exclusive perks. Click the join button to become a member now and get benefits like badges next to your name on videos, behind the scenes photos, advantages during the live trivia game, discounts on merchandise, private one-on-one -on -one video chats, the ability to request future video topics, and exclusive 8-10 to 10 minute videos on the history of the NFL. And now, on with our feature presentation. A while ago, I made a video about this game right here. A 1989 battle between the Atlanta Falcons and the San Francisco 49ers. You can learn more about that game by clicking the card in the upper right corner. However, more than three decades later, this game is notable for a very interesting reason. And that is the fact that the Falcons played this game without a kicker. Seems insane that a team could actually play an NFL game without having one of the most important positions out there on the field. But due to injuries and just poor roster management, the Falcons entered this game against the best team in the NFL and the defending Super Bowl champion without a kicker. Meaning that this man, starting quarterback Chris Miller, had to be the kicker. The good news is that this injury actually didn't mean anything in the grand scheme of things. Miller hit his low field goal attempt. The bad news was that the Falcons lost 45-3. Whether they had a kicker or not, obviously, they don't win the game, and the impact was non-existent, seeing as Miller was perfect. But now, I want you to imagine that a team not only loses their kicker, but loses their punter as well. And I don't mean that both the kicker and the punter got hurt during the game. I mean that they lost both of these positions before the game even started, so they played the entire 60 minutes without a single specialist on their roster. No one to kick the football, no one to punt the football, nothing. A scenario like that seems absolutely absurd, right? Well, that's exactly what happened to the New Orleans Saints during week 2 of the 1979 season, when they had to play an entire game against the Green Bay Packers without anyone who could actually kick the football. As for how it turned out, well, let's just say that kicker and putter seem like two positions you really shouldn't skimp out on, and it's pretty obvious after this one why you shouldn't. Because this is the story behind one of the strangest schemes in NFL history, and the time a team played a game without a kicker or a punter. Before I talk about the actual game in question, we need some context to understand the importance of this game, as well as what the original plan for the Saints was. Because obviously, even though they were an incredibly poorly run franchise back then, they didn't exactly intend to go into a game without a kicker or a punter. It's September 9th, 1979. It's week two of the NFL season, and we've got an NFC battle on our hands at Milwaukee County Stadium between the New Orleans Saints and the Green Bay Packers. It's early on in the season, but this is an important game for both of these squads, especially since both the Saints and Packers lost in Week 1, with the Saints losing an overtime thriller at the hands of the Atlanta Falcons, and the Packers losing a not-so-thrilling 6-3 game at the hands of the Chicago Bears. The last thing you want to do after two weeks is be 0-2. For some perspective, since the NFL-AFL merger in 1970, there had been 78 teams to make the playoffs, with 10 in 1978 and 8 every other year. Of those 78 teams, only one of them started 0-2. If you are winless through your first two games, you've got quite the uphill climb to make the playoffs. I'll put it that way. So this was a big one. And if the Saints were going to win this one, in all likelihood, they would need to have a great game on special teams especially after their first game ended like... Hey, the snap goes over the head of Erksleben. Erksleben picks it up and tries to throw it. It's intercepted and it's taken in for a touchdown. Yeah, that happened. The man throwing the football on this botched play? This is Russell Erksleben, and the Saints viewed him as one of the greatest special teams players of all time. In fact, they were so high on him that they drafted him 11th overall in the 1979 NFL Draft. No, I did not misspeak. I did not mean to say the 11th round. 
I meant that he was the 11th overall pick. Hall of Fame tight end Kellen Winslow, longtime Jets defensive lineman Marty Lyons, Pro Bowl linebacker Jerry Robinson, and five-time Pro Bowl guard Ken Hill are all guys who went in the first round that were chosen after Ergsleben. The Saints seriously drafted a punter in the first round. Which raises the question, why the heck did they do it? Well, I could do an entire video on the history of this player and his rise and fall, but long story short, Erg Slavin was not just a punter. He was a kicker as well. When he was at Texas, he served as the team's punter and averaged over 45 yards per punt with the Longhorns over his final three seasons. Keep in mind that in 1978, the top punter in the NFL in terms of yards per punt was Pat McAnally of the Cincinnati Bengals, and he was averaging 43.1 yards per punt, with the league average being somewhere in the ballpark of 39 yards per punt. So Erg Slavin was a great punter, and he also served as the team's kicker, hitting 76.5% of his field goals during his senior season. That might not sound great today, but consider this, that field goal percentage was the second best total in the Southwest Conference, and in the NFL, the average kicker was hitting somewhere around 60% of their kicks, with only six guys hitting above 75%. Heck, the first team All-Pro kicker that year by the Associated Press was Pat Leahy, who you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner, and he was at 73.3% with no kicks in the 50-plus yard range. So the Saints chose Ertzleben not just because he was a great punter, but because he was a great kicker and could double up. You wouldn't have to waste a roster spot on a punter and a kicker like every other team. You could combine the two into one position. Is an extra roster spot with a jack-of-all-trades specialist worth a first-round pick? Well, you be the judge of that. However, I'm sure you might be able to see where this one is going. The beauty of having one guy who can play two positions is that you only need to use one roster spot. The downside is that, should said player get hurt, you need to not only sign a replacement kicker, but you need to sign a replacement punter, since you're not just going to find a guy off the street who can do both. On September 6th, three days before the game, Eric Slavin pulled a leg muscle in practice. Now, the Saints were incredibly optimistic about Ertzleben, and head coach Dick Nolan said on the injury, it's just a little thing, nothing serious. They had a good feeling that he was going to play from this. And because of this, the Saints were willing to bite the bullet and chance it. They were going to fly out to Milwaukee and play this scheme under the assumption that Ertzleben could play. They figured that the injury would recover by game time. It wouldn't mean anything and they didn't want to have to cut two players and sign two players at the last minute and chance that those two guys get taken by some other team. The risk of losing two guys was not worth the reward of having a healthy kicker and punter who might not even suit up since Erk Slavin was supposed to be ready to go. And then, pre-game warm-ups happened. Turns out, the Saints gambled, and they gambled horribly going all in on a three and a six of different suits. Because during the warm-ups, that injury was no better, and he couldn't go. You would think that the Saints would have had Erg Slavin kick something before flying up to Milwaukee, or would do something before he actually stepped onto the field at Milwaukee County Stadium. But regardless, it was clear that he could not go. As Nolan said, it's just one of those things. He's got a pulled muscle, and there's nothing you can do about it. So this meant that the Saints were going to go into this all-important game, not just without a kicker, but without a punter. Outside of their long snapper, they did not have a single specialist on the roster. Imagining something like that today is almost unheard of, but that's the situation that the Saints were going to play this game against the Packers with, after a gamble gone horribly wrong. Their fullback, Tony Galbraith, who had never made a kick in his college or professional career, was going to be the team's kicker. Their wide receiver, Wes Chandler, who had never attempted a punt in his college or professional career, was going to be the team's punter. 
They were going into the gate, pulling up to the stadium, assuming that they were just going to be playing offense, when their coach springs up on them, Oh yeah, by the way, you guys are kicking today. Good luck. Which leads to the obvious question. How the heck did this experiment go? How did the Saints play without a single kicker or punter on their roster, and with two position players handling those duties? Well, let's start with the punting side of things with Wes Chandler. The Saints offense actually played well enough that they didn't have to rely on Chandler's leg too much, as the Saints only ended up punting one time. But that one punt? Oof, it was a... it was not a good one. Punting on 4th and 8 from the 40-yard line, Chandler's punt is a short one, and is fair caught at the 37. It's a 23-yard punt. Remember that the Saints drafted Erksleben because he was averaging 45 yards per punt in college. This punt was half of that. A mere 23 yards, and instead of pinning them inside the 20 or the 10 like even an average punter would do in that situation, the Packers have the ball near midfield, and have great field position, using that to eventually score a touchdown. As for the kicking side, the Saints definitely left some points on the board with Galbraith as the kicker. It's the second quarter, and after Archie Manning throws a quick pass to Henry Childs, who takes it all the way for the touchdown, the Saints send Tony Galbraith on to kick the extra point. Remember, you can't go for two that bad, so this was not an option. Galbraith lines up, and it's a complete shank, coming nowhere close to splitting the uprights. The form is actually not terrible, but the kick obviously left a lot to be desired. And then comes, I'm not kidding, one of the craziest and stupidest things I've seen a coach do, considering the circumstances. With the Saints leading by 12 at the end of the first half, they have the ball with 3 seconds left at the 2-yard line. Option 1 is to go for it, and make it an 18 or a 19 point game, and really put this scheme out of reach. Option 2 is to let your running back, who may I remind you, had never made a kick entering this game, who has no kicking experience, and who just barely missed an extra point, try a field goal. Which do you think will produce a better chance at success? It's almost like asking what is more likely, Tiger Woods hitting a 10-foot putt, or a 5-year-old who has never picked up a club before hitting a 5-foot putt. That's what it boiled down to. The Saints, for some reason, tried the field goal, and let Galbraith attempt a kick. And the kick is closer to Green Bay than it is to the goalposts, which is a problem because this game was in Milwaukee. That's four points left on the board, and you can make it seven points since there was a fourth down in the fourth quarter that the Saints, in a normal world, absolutely would have kicked the field goal. But they opted to go for it, and they failed. His kickoffs were also not very good, either falling short, or not getting hang time, or both, and it set the Packers up with great field position and a few scoring opportunities. Unsurprisingly, the Saints lost this game 28-19. On paper, this was a game that the Saints should not have lost. They had 474 yards of offense compared to 309 for the Packers. In 1978, so the year before, Teams to record at least 460 yards of offense in a game were 16-1, with the one loss being by the Seahawks, oddly enough, in a game against the Packers. But that can be explained by the fact that they turned it over seven times. But in this game, the Saints didn't lose the turnover battle. They held the Packers to just over 300 yards of offense. They had eight more first downs. They averaged over five yards per carry. They sat David Whitehurst three times. They outgained the Packers 289 to 115 in passing yardage. By all accounts, New Orleans should not have lost this scheme. But when you factor in the third phase of the game with special teams, and look at the poor kickoffs by Galbraith, the poor pump by Chandler, and the points missed by Galbraith on field goals and extra points, it all adds up, and it all makes a bit more sense. As for Russell Erksleben, Turns out, he wouldn't play another game in 1979, 
as he missed the rest of the season with an injury. Whatever Dick Nolan said about the injury was clearly wrong. It was not a short-term thing. It was clearly something serious, and the Saints had to sign a punter and a kicker the rest of the way, signing Rick Partridge and Gary Apremian to fill those roles. The Saints ended up missing the playoffs by one game, going 8-8, eight and eight, one game off of the Los Angeles Rams at 9-7 and seven for the NFC West crown. Between this game against the Packers, where they didn't have a specialist, the Week 1 debacle against the Atlanta Falcons, and their Monday night collapse against the Oakland Raiders, which you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner, Man, there were so many missed opportunities for New Orleans this season. Maybe if they had a special team square for this Green Bay game, they make the playoffs. Who knows? So what's the moral of the story here? You need special teams players before a game. It is not a position that you can skimp out on. It just isn't. If you don't have a kicker or a punter, you are going to leave points on the board. And you are going to be in for a bad time where you have a legitimate chance of losing a game. Those positions exist for a reason. And if there's even a chance that your specialist can miss the game with an injury, it's better to be safe than sorry, because it's just not worth it otherwise to chance it. Because in 1979, as the Saints found out during their battle against the Packers, you ain't winning games without a kicker or a punter. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jj9shop.com and be sure to like and subscribe as it really helps the channel out a lot. Join me every Wednesday night where we'll play NFL trivia for cash prizes at 9 p.m. Eastern over on Twitch. To learn more about the history of college football, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To learn more about the history of Major League Baseball, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 7. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.